Good evening. Good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Good to see everybody out. Well, who's got an object of prayer you want to mention tonight? I've got a Attorney Todd Balkman texted me and said they were setting up a hospice bed for Jerry and calling in hospice on him. That's the church, remember him, his family, <coughs> on both sides. And I've got other options. Danny Morgan. Good morning. Remember my cousin's family of Marsh Green, he brought to her last night. His wife and I and his girls. Pat 
not to or will be done. Everybody can and will. Let's go to pray. Okay, Joshua chapter 9. But you already knew that, didn't you? Bet you don't know what verse. We're going to start in verse 17. The children of Israel journeyed and came into their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and Shephira and Beeroth and Kerjath Jerim. And the children of Israel smote them not, because the princes of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the princes. But all the princes said unto all the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore we may not touch them. May God add his blessings to his word tonight. So last week we started looking at and talking about the complications of compromise. Uh, compromise can often come with complications, unforeseen complications. Uh, now, as we said, compromise is not always bad. Sometimes it's needed, and sometimes it can even be good. Uh, but it often does come with some things that we don't expect, and it can get complicated. Rarely does it always turn out like we thought it would doesn't always go as smooth and as easy as we would like. And that's what the Israelites were finding out here as they are experiencing some complications. What they've done is they've made a league with the Gibeonites. Uh, you see that back up in verse uh, 15. Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And so they've entered into this agreement with these people. And the compromise is that they're not... Uh, following through on the commandment that God had given to them, which was to utterly destroy all the people of the land. And so we see one of the complications that arises here after the children of Israel, they've all picked up once they hear that they've been deceived, they find out, of course, that these people are not from a far off place, but rather they're their neighbors. And so basically the whole uh, nation picks up in verse 17 and goes up there. Uh, to their four cities. And in verse 18, we see one of the complications that comes from this. And, the, and all the congregation murmured against the princes. Not just murmured about, but murmured against. So we see that there's some dissension growing here within the ranks, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, they're beginning to question their leaders. They're beginning to doubt their leadership ability. And so... Uh, there's been a loss of confidence, I would say, that has taken place here. We don't always see these things coming ahead of time, but uh, they do tend to arise. And we'll pick up in verse number 19 uh, in this situation. It says, But all the princes said unto all the congregation, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will even let them live lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swear unto them. So they begin to try to explain to the people why we can't smite them. Here's the reason we can't do to them like we did to Jericho and Ai. Here's why this is different. They said we made an oath. We swore to them. We have promised uh, this to them, that we're not going to kill them, that we're going to let them live. And they said we've sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Uh, so we can't do this. We may not touch them. Verse 20 says, here's what we will do. They said, we're going to let them live. We're going to leave them alone. We're not going to wipe them out. 
lest wrath be upon us. Because if we do, then wrath will come to us. God's wrath will come to us. Because of the oath which we swear unto them. Now, what we see here, you know, we might have some negative thoughts about these princes, about the leaders. But you can say this for them. Uh, that they were demonstrating a quality that is extremely rare today, and that is honor. They chose to honor the oath that they had made. For better or for worse, they are keeping their word. Wouldn't it be refreshing? Wouldn't it be nice to see our leaders do the same? They make us all these promises, and you wonder if they had any intention of keeping any of them. Because they get in there and do whatever they want to anyway. But here, they're keeping their word. Uh, it's refreshing to see. And they're doing this despite it being unpopular with the people. Now, maybe they knew this beforehand or at least had an idea that this might not be the most popular decision. But they've got the whole congregation murmuring against them now. Grumbling about this and the decision they've made. And so this is... Hurting them, you could say. It's hurtful to them in a, both a personal and a political way. And you let our leaders today think that they're going to be hurt politically, you can forget it. They're not about to, to risk that. But here we see it happening to these leaders, but they're still standing on the promise that they've made. And that's a good thing because God said that he would honor us for keeping those promises that are hard to keep. Sometimes you'll tell somebody something, I'll do this or I'll do that, and you, you think, uh-oh, this is going to be hard for me to do. And so you got two choices, right? Either follow through on it or try to get out of it. But God said he would honor those who don't change. That's over in Psalm 15, verse 4. If you want to read it later, David said that. So now the question might arise, though, why would God honor them for honoring an oath that contradicted his original commandment? Like we already said, God had already told them that they were to go in and just utterly destroy all the inhabitants of the land, to not let them live. So why would God honor something that was keeping them from doing his will, what he had told them to do? Well, first, I don't believe he would have if Joshua and the Israelites had done this out of willful disobedience. If they knew what they were doing, in other words, if they had complete knowledge that this would take them away from God's commandment and cause them to break his commandment, I don't believe God would have honored them. That wasn't the case. You have to remember they were tricked here. All right? The Gibeonites lied to them. The Gibeonites deceived them. And so they made this league out of ignorance. They thought these people aren't from around here. They're from a far off country, so we can make this agreement with them because they're not uh, the, one of the inhabitants of the land. So there's ignorance involved here and deception as well. And so they weren't deliberately going against God. They were not intentionally going against what God had told them to do. They didn't mean to. Okay, They did not mean to disobey. So there's a difference between willful disobedience and ignorant disobedience. You ever done something wrong because you just didn't know no better? You found out later that you messed up or that it was wrong? That was done out of ignorance. But now there are times when we know exactly what we're doing. And we do it anyway. We choose to disobey. That's willful disobedience. So it's all about what's in your heart at that moment. Is it something you wanted to do? Is it something that, like we said, you chose to do? It's about what's on your mind. Did you know what you were doing? Were you aware that this was wrong? And that this was disobeying God. If you didn't, that's a different kind of situation. We know their real failing in this situation was that they didn't ask God to guide them. Remember back up in 
uh, I believe it's verse 14, the last part of that verse, says they asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. That was what they did wrong. That was their mistake here. They should have asked God for his guidance, for him to show them what to do, but they didn't. It's like the old saying, though, two wrongs don't make a right. And they don't. Yes, it was wrong to make this league with the Gibeonites. And yes, it was wrong not to consult the Lord first. That was definitely wrong. But it would have also have been wrong to not keep their word, to break this promise that they had made. So they had to keep it. And one of the main reasons they had to keep it is because they had sworn it by the Lord. It says there in uh, verse 19, We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. So that means not only had they made this promise to the Gibeonites, they had made this promise to the Lord. That makes it different, doesn't it? And that's why they say, we can't do this. We may not touch them because God is holding us accountable for this oath that we've made, not just to them, but to him also. And God was going to hold them to it. And he did. You can see uh, in the, what takes place after this. The Gibeonites were never really a problem. If you look at what takes place in the years to come. In fact, they kind of helped Israel. They were sort of an ally. Uh, like we said, Gibeon was where the ark stayed on more than one, of, one occasion. Uh, one of David's mighty men was a Gibeonite. So they, they were all right. But Israel, there was one incident where they didn't hold up their end of the bargain. And we talked about that too. And that's where Saul, uh, he got all this patriotic zeal, and he decided that he wanted to show, I guess, what a great leader he was or what a, a mighty leader he was and prove what a true Israelite he was. And he went out and started killing the Gibeonites, not letting them live, which was what they had promised them. And because of that, God sent three years of famine to Israel. So God was holding them to this. Two wrongs don't make a right. And so how does this apply to me and you? How can we put this into practice in our life? I think this should serve to caution us that we need to be careful about the promises that we make to God, the oaths that we swear to Him the vows that we've taken before him. Because we might not take those things seriously, but I promise you that he does. And he's going to hold us to them, just like he did his people here. All right? Verse 21. It says, And the princes said unto them, Let them live. But let them be hewers of wood and drawers of water unto all the congregation." as the princes had promised them. So here comes the but. There's always a but when you've got a compromise. You say, this, 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 but. You know there's a but coming. Well, here we find it in verse number 21. They said, all right, we're going to let them live. That's what they want. That's what they've asked for. That's what we're going to do. But here's what we get out of it. Here's what we're going to do to them. We're going to let them be hewers of wood, and drawers of water. So they're going to do our logging for us, and they're going to make sure we have a, a water supply, a steady, reliable uh, water supply. They're going to cut the wood, and they're going to draw the water and bring it to all the congregation. So we're going to assign them these menial tasks. Uh, that's going to be our benefit in this arrangement that we've made. Okay, and all this is happening outside their cities. Remember, Israel's all come up there together, and they're murmuring, they're not happy. And so they have this discussion among themselves, and I guess kind of get it settled, because then in verse 22, we see it says, And Joshua called for them, that's the Gibeonites, and he spake unto them, saying, Wherefore have ye beguiled us, saying, We are very far from you when ye dwell among us. So Joshua calls them out. And they come out there, I guess their leaders or representatives, whoever it was, maybe the same guys that 
had uh, come to them before. We don't know. But they come, and Joshua wants to know why. Why did you do this? Why did you lie to us? Why did you deceive us? Saying you were from far off when you're right here living among us. So how did they answer? That's in verse 23. He says, Now therefore are ye cursed, and there shall none of you be freed from being bondmen, and hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God. Their answer is coming in the next verse. Sorry. Uh, Joshua had more to say. He curses them. He places a curse upon these people. And what is the curse? He says, none of you are going to be free. You're all going to be our slaves, which is what you asked for, remember? Uh, back up there in verse number 8, they came and they said unto Joshua, we are thy servants. So they're getting exactly what they asked for. But he's saying none of you are going to be free. Not your children. Not your children's children. This is going to apply to your descendants. Not one of you is going to be free. You're all going to have to cut wood and haul water. That's how you're going to spend your lives, and you're going to do it uh, for the house of my God. He says, so it's not just for the people, for the congregation, but it's also going to be for the service of the tabernacle as well, that they'll be doing this. Now their answer is in verse 24. And they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainly told thy servants how that the Lord thy God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So I like the way they say it was certainly told. Somebody told them this and there was no uncertainty about it whatsoever. Wouldn't it be good? If we were to tell people about the Lord the same way, and if we could certainly tell them, there'd be no doubt, no question about what we were saying to them. They ought to be able to, to, to feel that from us. They ought to be able to see that in us. They ought to know that I believe what I say I believe. It ought to be evident in the life that I live, and it ought to also be clear in the way that I talk to them the things that I say to them. They're persuaded here, right? They're convinced that this is going to happen. How good a job are we doing persuading people that Jesus is coming back? How many have we convinced of that fact, of that truth, and caused to believe? It's a good question. Oh, that God would help you and me to certainly tell people about him. That was the case with the Gibeonites. And so uh, they, they believe that God has given the, given the Israelites the land and that he told them to kill everybody, to destroy them all. And so here's what they say as their justification. Therefore, we were sore afraid of our lives because of you and have done this thing. We did this thing because we were sore afraid of you. Not just afraid, but sore afraid. Fear is a powerful thing. Especially when you get somebody fearing for their life. And that's what they were doing. And as a result, they gave up everything. Not just of themselves, but for their families. Uh, the, all of their people were willing to become slaves in order to save their lives. And so this brings up a question that I think is relevant for you and me, particularly in the time that we are living in right now. And that the question is, how much of our freedom are we willing to give up just to save our lives? How much are we willing to allow to be taken away from us just so that we can survive? The Gibeonites gave up everything. We'll see more about that in a minute. They gave up all their freedom. 
Now they're cutting wood and hauling water for somebody else for the rest of their lives. Something that's interesting is that Israel would be faced with this same question more than once in the years that followed. And most recently this happened to them during World War II, particularly in Nazi Germany and in Europe, where they had to decide how much they were willing to give up just to save their lives. It started kind of innocently enough where they began to lose certain privileges. They couldn't eat at the local cafe. They weren't allowed to go to parks and other public places. They had to wear these yellow stars on their clothes. Everywhere they went, the Star of David, they had to have it on so that everyone would immediately know that they were Juden, that they were a Jew. So they couldn't go to these different businesses. They weren't allowed to to shop there. And then it got to the point where they couldn't have uh, businesses of their own. It was not uh, lawful for them to own their own business. And so they began to lose their jobs. They took their jobs away from them. And then it progressed from there, and they took their homes away from them. And they forcibly moved them all into ghettos. They had to live in these horrible conditions just to stay alive. So they did all this. They gave up all of these things and they killed them anyway. Folks, history can teach you something if if you'll study it. They let them take their, their privileges. They let them take their jobs, their businesses. They let them even take their homes just so that they'd let them live. And then they sent them to the concentration camps anyway. Started loading them on cattle cars and hauled them off to be exterminated. So you and I are living in a world that is not like that yet. But where a lot of similar things are going on. I hope you're paying attention because it's happening, okay? Not just in the world, not just in Europe, not just in Germany or some far off place, but it's happening here in this country. I hate to say that, but it's true. We're seeing rights being taken away from us, more so in the past year than I've ever known in my life. Now in places like Canada, Harmless little Canada and California, churches have been shut down. And they've told them, you can't do that. You can't go to church. You can't worship God. The state telling folks that. And So how much are we willing to give up just to live? How fearful are we for our lives? And this is particularly troubling to me given that it is happening in the United States of America. Because if you'll study history again, you'll see that this country was founded all about freedom. It was all for freedom. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what this country was founded on. That's what the United States of America was all about. Freedom, individual freedom. It's like Patrick Henry said. You remember what he said? He said, give me liberty or give me death. He said, I don't want to live if I can't be free. Now you compare that to what was happening with the Gibeonites here. They were giving up all their liberty just to live. This man said, either let me be free or let me die. And my feeling has always been this. I would much rather die standing on my feet than live on my knees. I would much rather 
Die a free man, then live bending down, bowing down before somebody. And I think Jesus knew that we were going to be faced with this. That he knew this was coming to his people because he put it to us in another way. So let's look at what he said in the Gospel of John for just a minute. John chapter 12. I hope I can see this. My light died. John chapter 12 and verse 25. These words are in red, so that means this is our Savior speaking. It says, He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Now the key words in that verse, there are three of them. And they are in this world. He's talking about our lives here in this world. How much do we love this life? How much do we love our life and living in this world? Now remember what we're talking about here. When we're talking about this life, we're talking about, what, 70 years, three score and ten, maybe 80 by reason of strength. If God's merciful to us, we might live to be 80 years. Might not live that long, might live longer. But basically that's all that the Lord promised us, 70 years. So we're talking about a very temporary thing. I'm standing here at 55 tonight. I'm getting close to that. And I tell you, it's gone by fast. It really has. So how much are we going to love something that's really just a drop in the bucket in the face of eternity? And yet, even when we realize this, even when we are reminded of this, there still seems to be this desire to hold on to it. To not let this life, our life in this world, go. We don't want to lose our position in this world. We don't want them to take away our jobs. Uh, we want to be able to continue to, to provide for ourselves. So we don't want to lose that. We don't want to lose our possessions either. I mean, that's clear by how hard we work to acquire material things and to gain material wealth. We don't want to give those things up. We enjoy them. And then we don't want to lose our privileges either. We don't want them to say, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. Uh, you can't eat at this restaurant or you can't go to a movie or you can't go to some public event. Uh, because of this. We want to keep those privileges. So how much are we willing to give up to hold on to that? Just so we can go to Disney World. Or to, to a ball game. Or whatever it may be. Because that's life in this world. Okay? We don't want suffering. Even though we're following a man who was a man acquainted was suffering. He was the suffering servant. He suffered for you and me. But we want to avoid all the suffering we can. Don't want persecution. Don't want opposition. Don't want this world uh, fighting against us. We don't want to have to sacrifice either. Give up these things of this life. The things of this world. We want to hold on to those, and keep them. And then we don't want to have to uh, be segregated either. Remember the Jews walking around with the yellow stars on? That was meant to segregate them so that they could be pushed aside, not allowed to be a full member of society. What if they come to us someday and say, all right, y'all going to have to start wearing yellow crosses 
wherever you go. How's that going to make you feel? I, well, I, for, I, for one, will be proud. I'll wear that cross with pride, no matter what it costs me, no matter the discrimination that it might bring. So Jesus is saying, if you love this life, you're going to lose it. It's going to end. So what he was really saying to you and me is that we cannot put our hope in this world. This world is not our home. We cannot look at it that way and start putting down roots here and loving it in that way. Saying, this is my home. This is not my home. Uh, my home is on high tonight. I love this country. I'm a citizen of this country, but first and foremost, I am a citizen of heaven. I belong to a, a better country that's not made by human hands. So Jesus is saying, don't put your hope in this life. Because if you do, you will be of all men most miserable. He's saying, hate this life. Which I don't think any of us do. I, I enjoy this. I used to enjoy this life a whole lot more than we do now. But this world has some good things that we do enjoy. But he's saying, make this choice. Make the right choice. Choose eternal life, not temporary life. Now I want us to see an example of some who would do this or some who are going to do this. So turn with me to the book of Revelation. Chapter 12. Revelation 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. There's you an example of people who made the right choice the good choice. They loved not this life, their life here in this world, to the death. These are those who are going to be uh, sacrificed, who are going to be killed during the tribulation. And they, their life was literally on the line. And they're going to make the right choice. They're not going to love this life that much. Their choice is to uh, to put their faith in Christ and overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. They're overcoming Satan there, the accuser. And they, they have made the choice that uh, this is not their home, that they belong to a different kingdom. In verse 10, this voice is saying, the kingdom of our God has come. I belong to that kingdom. And I look forward to the day when that kingdom comes. Amen. Let's make the same choice. This life, with all its many pleasures and joys that it may bring, it's temporary. It is not all there is. The best is yet to come. All right, questions or comments? All right, so I'll see Father, we thank you, God, for your holy word. God, for the way that you speak to our hearts. When we be still, God, to allow you that you will guide us, you will direct us, Heavenly Father, as we go through this walk of life. God, we yearn for this. We ask you, 
the wisdom, understanding, and knowledge of your word, God, that we might be the vessels you'd have us to be. Thank you for our pastor tonight, God, the way he brought this out. God, let it ring in our hearts. God, help us to always be willing to take a stand for you. God, you took a stand for us. You carried our sins. You bore them on the cross. You saved us. God, may we ever live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.